So if you've come with us this far, you know that the most effective method of learning is learning by being. And being requires change. That's called becoming. And the first step to becoming a genius in whatever field you choose is duplication. Now, if this doesn't make any sense to you, you didn't watch the first two videos, go back and do that now. Here's the link. And uh, then watch this video. Otherwise, without the preliminaries, you'll be grasping <laughs> for the meaning. So what we're doing here is we're learning by becoming. Being is the best way because it comes from inside of you spontaneously. There's no script. Uh, it's not necessary because you are the thing that you're trying to be. You are the genius, the master of the subject that you're trying to learn. So if you're not already that genius, how do you become that genius? The first step is duplication. You must be working from an exact copy of the source materials. The second step, however, is understanding. Now, what is understanding? When we're with someone that we know and that knows us really well, we can say, we understand each other. It means we really know each other. It means we have internalized each other's being to such a degree that we can predict the effect of any word or incident on your consciousness, isn't it? And that's a very pleasant feeling of intimacy. We have a saying, I get it. I get you. I, I know what you're getting at. Uh, what, is it, what is it that you're getting? You're getting the duplication of the other person's mind. So this concept of duplication is very powerful and it's fundamental. If you're not working with an exact copy of the original thing that you're trying to learn, how can you learn it? And we'll get into the exact standard of duplication later, but it's much higher than you have been trained or led to believe. Real duplication means an exact copy. And how that's possible? By knowing the definitions of all the terms and symbols used in the original material. You should be able to recite the definitions by heart. That's how well, that's how down cold you have to have your original material. This is not an exaggeration. That's why real students of a subject can quote verbatim from the source materials. Then by modeling the meaning of those source materials in a cause and effect relationship, you come to understand it. Uh, I do this over here and it causes this over here. I tweak this and it does that. And there's a cause and effect relationship in time. So what we're doing here by developing understanding is actually telling a story about the subject that we're learning. It's like constructing a narrative based on the material that you've duplicated that describes how the thing works. The theory of operations, if you will. But the actual process that goes on inside your mind is one of modeling. And modeling in terms of cause and effect. Building a narrative, building a story. And we'll go through all the stages on how to do that. But first, we're going to review some of the materials, some of the concepts from the previous video, just to embed it even further in your understanding. Because that's how this works. Practice means making something happen and doing a lot of it, making it happen again and again and again. 
And then going back over it and becoming familiar with every step, <clears throat> every phenomenon involved in that doing until you are completely familiar with all the range of cause and effect within that phenomenon. Then we can say we really have understanding. How do we get that understanding? Let's go back and review the theory once again. You remember, we started off from the premise that the most efficient way of learning is to change your being. And in Buddhism, this is called becoming. Actually, the same word means both, being and becoming, bhava. So by becoming, we become the thing that we want to learn. In other words, don't just learn about medicine. Become a doctor. Don't just learn about music. Become a musician. And master whatever your subject is. Whatever your object is, you want to become that thing so thoroughly that you don't have to think, you don't have to calculate, you don't have to consult reference books or look it up on Google. You know and you respond because you are the master. This is the technique that we're giving, which has never really been understood well in the Western world. So you have to start from thorough grounding in the rudiments of whatever it is you're studying especially the vocabulary, because the vocabulary is what gives you the name and form of the being that you're trying to attain. Let's go over it one more time. Becoming is a process called dependent origination. That means each step of the process is dependent upon the step that goes before it. So from ignorance is coming fabrication, from fabrication is coming consciousness, from consciousness is becoming name and form and so on, until you get down to birth, aging and death, and suffering. Then, once someone bottoms out in suffering, well, the next stage is for them to take up the Eightfold Path, the end of becoming. And we're going to get to that after we go through mastering the process of becoming, because the Eightfold Path is also a process of becoming. It's just one that leads to enlightenment, nibbana, and unbinding, the end of suffering. So we're going to learn both sides of this figure, the left side first. In our study of becoming, for applications like learning and leadership, we are especially interested in this part of dependent origination. And we call this, in our materials, the process of becoming. It's not all the stages, but most of the stages of dependent origination. For the purpose of investigating learning as a process of becoming, we will divide the stages a little differently. We divide them into four. Duplication, understanding, analysis, and metacognition. Now, why do we concentrate so much on terms, words, and definitions? Because the stage of name and form and the stage of consciousness have a feedback loop between them. You cannot separate them, really. It's, it's almost artificial to make them into two stages because they're basically one and the same thing. You could look at name and form as a gate on consciousness. In other words, the name and form that you have labels for is what you're going to be conscious of. And if you don't have labels, if you don't have a name or a form for that particular phenomenon, you won't be conscious of it even if it's right in front of your nose. Let me give you a great example. When the Spanish Armada laid anchor off of the coast of South America, the natives the Mayans and the Incas did not see it. It was invisible to them. They could not see it because they did not have a category in their set of name and forms for ocean-going vessels. They did their best to just shut it out of their consciousness and ignore it. And then when the Spaniards came out in their armor, on their mounted, on their steeds, 
This really freaked the Mayans out because they didn't have a concept for that either in their name and form. Yet these guys were showing up and killing them. It would be just like as if, I don't know, some aliens from outer space started killing people with some kind of nano weapons or something that we have no name for. At first, people wouldn't want to believe that it was happening. They wouldn't see that it was happening. They would see something else. They would call it something that was already present in their network of names and forms, in their ontology. And we're going to get deep into ontological analysis in the next video. Right now, we're just laying the foundation, laying the groundwork for that analysis. Duplication is a, a somewhat tedious process. I know you have to look things up in the dictionary and nobody wants to do that. <laughs> I had one student who I was telling for over a year, I think it was about a year and a half, you have to clear your definitions in the dictionary. You have to clear your definitions. He wouldn't do it. He just wouldn't do it. Of course, he was like the slowest student <laughs> that we had in the ashram in India. Finally, after a year and a half, one day he came to me and he said, Wow, I just had the most incredible experience. I said, What, did you see God or what? <laughs> he said, No, I looked up some words in the dictionary. And it's like, Everything is clear to me now. And I'm going, that's what I've been telling you for a year and a half since you got here, that the first thing you have to do when studying something is look up the terms. Then everything else is clear. Let's put it this way. You can bang your head against the wall studying a subject for years and not make as much progress as you can make in a week or two by identifying all the unique terms or uses of terms in that subject and looking up their definitions in a good dictionary. This is my experience. Mostly it's going to be outside of your ontology, outside of your name and form, because everybody knows the teacher is going to tell us to look up the words and we don't want to do it because the teacher told us, right? Duh. You know, sometimes teachers actually know something. <laughs> In this particular case, the teacher is right. And if you did this, you would find that 90% of the confusion of a subject would just melt away. And the rest will melt away when you get experience of the thing you're talking about. What we're doing when we're duplicating, getting all the terms defined, and then setting up a structure of terminology and analyzing it, we're actually creating the name and form of the being of that subject. If you want to become a doctor, what's the first thing you have to do? Learn anatomy. And what is anatomy? It's simply a bunch of terms for stuff that we know already about our, our own bodies, but don't have words for. Similarly, if you want to learn music, what's the first thing you do? You learn about quarter notes, eighth notes, half notes, A, B, C, D, and so on. This is vocabulary. This is terminology. This is the technical what is called terministic screen, upon which we project our awareness. And if there is no category or name and form for our awareness to land on, it doesn't land. And we are unaware of that phenomenon until we develop a terminology or a category of meaning for it. First, communication depends on language. We talked about communication last time. It means making a copy a duplication of what's in someone else's mind in your mind. That's learning, one phase of learning. Duplication, communication, depend on language. And we can be conscious of something only if we have a description of its name and form in our ontology. Like I said, we're going to go into ontology very deeply in the next video. Right now, we're laying the groundwork, laying the foundation for the study of ontology in learning. And it just gets better and better. You know, duplication is kind of a slog. It's a little bit tedious. And what we're going to be studying now in understanding is also a bit tedious and mechanical. But once we get to ontological analysis, you're going to be amazed how it's going to fly. Uh, so this whole thing uh, depends on having definitions for all the important terms in your subject. Once you have that established, everything goes like a dream. It's amazing.
What is a genius? Genius is defined as exceptional intellectual or creative power or other natural ability. A person who is exceptionally intelligent or creative, either generally or in some particular respect. The example they give is a musical genius. But I don't agree with this definition that genius is a natural ability. They seem to indicate that it can't be cultivated. It has to be inborn. And I don't accept that at all. I'm an expert in multiple fields at a high professional level of competence. But I don't feel myself to be extraordinarily intelligent. I mean, there were some times in my life when I was highly trained in a particular subject or activity, for example, music. And I could sit down and just sight read anything you put in front of me. I felt like a genius <laughs> when I was doing that. But I knew from my own experience, I had trained up to do that over many years of hard, methodical practice. So to me, it didn't seem like anything special. It's just like a person, if you do any kind of weight training or exercise, you start out the first day very light. Then over time, you gradually become stronger and stronger until you can do amazing things that, uh, that blow other people's minds. Huh? But to you, it's normal because why? You do it every time you work out. <laughs> when I started jogging, I could barely get around the track one time. After a while, I was jogging routinely five miles every morning. It was nothing, it was ordinary, because it was something I did every day. So, the same way, if you train how to become a genius in your particular field, whatever it is, even if you're of ordinary intelligence, which by the way, I think everybody is actually of ordinary intelligence, and either you train in the kind of things that IQ tests test for, or you train yourself in other things, like how to be popular in high school, and you miss all the academic stuff, and then you wind up thinking that you're dumb. No, you're not dumb. You just try to apply yourself in the wrong direction, in a temporary thing that doesn't yield any really beneficial results. The nerds in high school actually got more out of it than you did. Why? Because the things they learned benefited them later on when they went to college and in their careers. Becoming popular, you can learn anytime. <laughs> Try to understand, we're helping you lay the foundation for success in life, in any field, becoming a genius in any field. Now let's see, how is that possible? Let's define becoming genius as follows. Becoming genius uses concepts derived from the teaching of the Buddha and other spiritual disciplines, as well as advanced concepts in science, education, ontology, semantics, software and systems theory to master any subject so thoroughly that it results in a permanent change in being so that whatever you master becomes your spontaneous natural self-expression. Now you should look up all the important words in this definition, especially ontology, semantics, systems theory, and like that. But especially you should understand that the thing that gives you mastery as a spontaneous self-expression is being. And being is not just one thing. It's a collection of many things that form a kind of background or a kind of context to your consciousness. And this is name and form in the process of dependent origination. The Buddha called it name and form because in those days they didn't have words like ontology. <laughs> those were invented later by the Greeks, actually. But the Buddha used ontology in his teaching. He used semantics in his teaching. He was a very expert uh, wordsmith. And he utilized semantics to create a network of terminology that could explain the changes in consciousness that he was trying to share with people. So the Buddha is the pioneer, actually, in the creation of specific states of consciousness by making a set of terms, a name and form for those states that actually helps you attain that level of being. So actually we can do that not only for states of consciousness, we can do it for almost anything. 
And that's what this course is all about. The four stages of becoming genius for any given subject are duplication, making an exact copy of the source, understanding, systems thinking through logic, and that's the stage we're discussing today, analysis, contemplation of abstract relationships, also known as ontology, and metacognition, realization of a new state of being. I'm trying to think of a good example for ontology and how it influences consciousness. Did you ever go to a movie, an action movie, and you know Bruce Willis or whoever the action hero is, is doing all these incredible feats and uh, beating all these guys up or whatever. And you walk out of that movie feeling like, yeah, <laughs> ready to take on the world. Are you really? <laughs> Probably not. But you feel that way. Because watching 90 minutes or two hours of Bruce Willis surviving the most incredibly dangerous situations gives you the confidence that, hey, maybe I could do that too. What is that? That's name and form creating consciousness or gating consciousness in such a way that you feel you could actually duplicate some of those crazy stunts. Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> you probably can't. But it makes you feel like you could. And actually you could if you trained for it. Anybody could. If you have the time, the energy, and the facility for that kind of training. That's really the difference between you and Bruce Willis or an actor or you and a great musician or a great anything. Simply methodical training. Now, what is understanding? The subject of this video. The dictionary defines understanding as a noun, meaning the ability to understand something, comprehension, the power of abstract thought, intellect, an individual's perception or judgment of a situation. So the ability to understand something is really what we mean by duplication. If you can duplicate something, if you can make an exact copy of it in your own mind and analyze it to see how it works, you pretty much understand it. You know how to do it. Now, they take it a little higher. Comprehension. Comprehension actually means understanding how it works. I comprehend the activity or the working of a computer, for example. I know how the whole thing works. I used to work in the computer industry, and I understand RAM, ROM, code, operating systems, the whole bit, and I know pretty much how a computer works. That's comprehension, as distinct from understanding. I understand this is a computer and I know how to work it. If I really comprehend what a computer is, I know how it works and why it operates the way it does. Then they say, the power of abstract thought. What is abstract thought? Abstraction means taking information away from something until only the essential is left. And usually what you have then is a set of relationships. This is higher than that. That is connected to this other thing. This thing is the cause of something else. If you do this, that will happen, and so on. Those are abstract relationships. And in our next video on analysis, we're going to get really into this. Intellect. Well, of course, intel means intelligence, and ectos means work. So intellect means working with intelligence. Working with intelligence is completely different than working with brawn. It's brains instead of brawn. Huh? Producing an effect through the action of intelligence. This is much more efficient than physical work. Why? The, the pen is mightier than the sword. Why do we say that? Huh? And we see in history it's true. It may not appear to be true in the moment, but over a long span of time, intelligent people get paid more, they have more status, more power, and so many other things than you know people who work with their hands, for example. Well, why is that? Because intellect is a more efficient way of working. It's working with relationships 
and qualities of things instead of the physical being. So not that intelligence is everything, but it's one of the most important things when it comes to making our work and life efficient and successful. And finally, understanding is an individual's perception or judgment of a situation, situational awareness. What is the meaning of this situation? You're walking along the street and somebody says, Psst, hey, buddy, want to buy some software? <laughs> well, maybe it wouldn't happen walking along the street. Maybe it happens on the internet. Psst, hey, buddy, want to download some free software? What are the odds this download has got some virus in it or some malware? What are the odds that maybe it has a backdoor, you know, for the NSA or something? Pretty good. Why? Because this is an attack vector. This situation is designed to allow you to suspend your judgment. Uh, you suspend your good judgment. Well, wait a minute. I'm not getting this from an authorized source, so it could be contaminated with something. It could carry a payload that I'm not bargaining for here. You see, every situation has a strategy to it. Every situation has a meaning. Okay, if I'm in an airplane and suddenly the airplane adopts some unusual attitude, I know I better start worrying. <laughs> if you know airplanes, if you know flying, if you know when the plane should turn and how it should turn, you know, if you study your plats of your airport approaches and you know how the plane's going to come in or what beacons it's going to fly over and so on like that, you can actually track your flight pretty, pretty closely. But if it deviates from that pattern, then you know there's some problem, there's some issue. This is the meaning of things. The, the plane assuming an un, unusual attitude is the situation. But the meaning of that situation is something beyond the immediate situation. It has to do with context. The background that we bring to awareness of a particular situation. And mastery is all about context. In fact, you could say, you could even define mastery as the creation of a context that uses you. You know, normally when we do intelligent work, we use the information. We create the context. We give the meaning to the situation. But in a situation of mastery, when you're in a condition of mastery, it's the other way around. The context uses you. That's why we say it becomes your natural self-expression, your spontaneous response to a given situation. You don't have to think or calculate because you have the being of that kind of thing. You have the context that uses you in that situation. Any highly trained musician, for example, knows, uh, he experiences it. When the conductor gets up on the podium and wraps his baton, immediately they get ready to play, whatever it is. They don't even think about it. Why? Because as expert musicians, the context of expert musicianship is using them. So similarly, if you become an expert at anything, if you become a genius at anything, the context of that being is going to use you to be that thing. And that's expertise. That's genius. That's mastery. So how do we get there? by creating the name and form. Not any old way, but in a specific way that leads to mastery of that particular field. That's what we're doing. Now, for the purpose of skillful living, understanding means to apply your intelligence to a subject to comprehend how it works. This means building a dynamic model of a subject that incorporates cause and effect. This is how you attain understanding. Now, what's the relationship between understanding and duplication? In the previous video of this series, we presented the technique of duplication. Duplication is prerequisite to understanding because working with an imperfect or incomplete copy of the source material only leads to errors in understanding. It's just like if you download a program from the Internet and there's some error. Now, the software won't run. Or if it does run, there'll be some errors in the output. Maybe it'll crash your computer, who knows. So if we start thinking 
or analyzing from an imperfect copy of the original source material, how are we going to come up with the correct results? It's not possible. It's very, very important that we start with a clean copy, a perfect duplicate of the original material, assuming that the original material comes from an expert. By the way, that's one of the things we're going to analyze in our uh, ontological analysis. Make sure that the material we're studying actually contains all the information that we need to become expert. So we have to make a duplication of that information and then begin to analyze that to see the cause and effect. In fact, the process of understanding is one of the best ways to check the accuracy of duplication. If your standard of duplication is good, you will have little trouble building an understanding of the subject. Difficulty in understanding is a sign of inaccurate or incomplete duplication. Just like your computer crashing or other errors is a sign of some error in copying the software from the source. If you have an error in a definition of an important term, your model won't work. Your analysis won't work. It won't come up with correct results. Your situational awareness will fail. You'll get the wrong answer, uh, or you won't be able to perform the task or whatever it is. That's a sign that your duplication is incorrect, and you have to go back and retread your fundamentals in the subject. The actual standard of duplication is that you can recite the definition of each word and symbol appropriate to its context. If you can't do that, your process of duplication is incomplete. This is the actual standard of duplication, that you can recite the definition of each and every term especially the small relationship words such as if, then, for, such, at, around, up, down, <laughs> in, out. All these words have dozens of definitions. Look at the dictionary. You should be able to recite the proper definition according to the context. One of my favorites is up. Huh? Fill the car up. What do you mean? Fill the car on the ceiling? What are you talking about? No. Up, in that context, means in or into a condition or position of fullness or completion. I memorized the definition because we use that word so many times without any idea what it actually means. Uh, do it up, roll it up, light it up, fill it up. And what it really means is into a condition of fullness, completion. So there are many, many small words in the English language especially that have numerous, sometimes even conflicting meanings, depending on the context. You have to sort this out. I can't do it for you. Now we're going to look at some methods for understanding, some workable methods. What do I mean by workable? Practical, that they actually give the result that we're looking for. Outlining, handwriting, diagramming, clay modeling, mind mapping, and building an ontology. Why are these workable methods and maybe some other things like just reading aren't? You want to get away from the pure significance, the pure information of the terms. And you want to start bringing that significance into manifestation. This is the process of becoming. So the best way to do that is to take that original material, once you've made a copy of it in your own mind, then without looking at the source materials, to begin to manifest that by writing. And I mean handwriting. Writing with your own hand is very powerful. It's extremely uh, potent, especially when dealing with abstract subjects like math. Don't use a computer for math. Don't use uh, Mathematica or whatever it is much better to write it by hand than do it on the computer to make it neat. Why is that? Because you begin to engage the senses of your physical body in the process of obtaining the knowledge, obtaining the skills. You begin to bring the thing into manifestation. It's not just name and form anymore. Now it's senses. Uh, remember six senses is one of the stages in the process of dependent origination. So when you bring 
a subject from a name and form into the senses, you begin to make it yours. You begin to change your being physically. You begin to wire those connections into your neurons, into your brain, into your very muscles and bones. And this is why uh, physical training is so much important in skills like music and other things that are performance type of skills. But even for strictly knowledge-based skills, like math, for example, the writing out of the formulas, the writing out of the philosophy, if you're studying philosophy, diagramming the thing or clay modeling it, will give you a much, much better comprehension, much, much deeper understanding, and actually train you to uh, use the thing, uh, to become an expert at it, in a practical way. Outlining for understanding. The first workable method for building understanding is outlining, making an ordered, prioritized list of points. The dictionary defines outlining as making a general description or plan, giving the essential features of something, but not the detail. Any word processing software can be used to generate an outline, but we suggest that you write it by hand. Handwriting engages additional senses, including the kinesthetic sense, in the process of understanding. It also helps you to identify points that need more work. You were probably taught to outline in Harvard style, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here's an outline for the novel Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, and you see it's in spreadsheet form. And this novel is densely plotted, complex, lots of characters, lots of actions. So he puts it in the form of a spreadsheet. You notice all the uh, cells that are erased. <laughs> it's in pencil, and I recommend using pencil too. Speaking of creative outline formats, here's Henry Miller's manuscript plan for Tropic of Capricorn. As you can see, it doesn't look anything like a traditional outline. And yours doesn't have to either. You can put charts in there, you can put drawings, anything that makes sense to you to make sense of the subject that you're trying to wrap your mind around. Here's an outline from J.K. Rowling for one of her Harry Potter books. I don't know which one. And as you can see, this one's done in ink, but it's the same type of chart layout that Joseph Heller used for his books. Uh, this works for a lot of different subjects besides novels, though. You can try it on <clears throat> anything that's analytical, that has a lot of categories. It'll work great. Now, here's an interesting one. This is Gay Talese's outline for his profile on Frank Sinatra. It's done in magic marker, all kinds of different colors, sketches, weird shapes and arrows. It's like whatever works for you to get your idea out of your head and onto paper manually. Don't use computer programs, write. Now let's talk a little bit about clay modeling. A very useful and workable method for building understanding is clay modeling. Most people have never encountered it, so give it a try. You might think it's silly, only kids do that, but it is very powerful. It works on the principle of exchanging significance for mass, getting the concept out of your head and allowing you to physically manipulate and play with it. You don't have to use clay. Wooden blocks, nuts and bolts, or any odds and ends will do, as long as you label them properly. Now, here's a short demo of clay modeling. We're going to use ordinary modeling clay that you can buy in any toy store or stationery store very cheaply to demonstrate the process of planetary transits in astronomy. Okay, so what is a planetary transit? Here we have the Sun and the Earth. You can tell that's the Earth because it has a label. And then you have the Moon going around the Earth. 
okay so every so often the moon comes around in between the earth and the sun that just happened a couple of weeks ago when we made this video we had an eclipse of the sun so when the moon moves across the face of the sun from the earth's point of view that's called a transit sometimes Venus also does the same thing. Let's make the scale a little bigger here. Sometimes Venus goes between the Earth and the Sun in such a way that it crosses the Sun's disk and that's called a transit of Venus. Now a transit is also a conjunction in other words, the conjunction means that the planet and the sun, Venus and the sun, are in the same direction. It happens with the moon, too. When the moon is in the same direction as the sun, you have a conjunction between them. What's the difference between a conjunction and a transit? A conjunction doesn't necessarily mean that the moon moves in front of the sun. And covers it or that Venus moves in front of the Sun and covers it. Huh? A conjunction means that they're simply in the same direction. Now what about the outer planets? Let's put Mars here. Now do we ever have a transit of Mars? Well, yes, if there's any planets out beyond Mars and Mars happens to move across the face of the planet, like Jupiter, let's say, that would be a conjunction, I mean, a, sorry, a transit of Jupiter by Mars. So this can happen both towards the Sun and away from the Sun. This is just a very simple demonstration to give you an idea of what a clay demo is all about and how using a clay demo can actually make the idea, the concept come alive because we can we can sit here and line these things up the way they would actually look like here's the earth and here's the moon going around and the moon actually goes in front of the sun and that's a conjunction I'm uh, sorry a <laughs> transit or Venus actually going in front of the sun this happened just a few months ago. So in that way we can model these things, get the ideas out of our head and into physical space where we can move them around and model the phenomena that we're studying. It works with anything. Now let's quickly go over mind mapping. Mind mapping is another workable method for building understanding. Here is where software becomes very useful. You are building a network of concepts and terms and showing the hierarchical connections and relationships between and among them. Mind mapping is similar to outlining, but more free form. What you're really doing here is building a taxonomy, a network of terms expressing the elements of your subject and beginning to map the relationships between and among them. Mind mapping the important terms and concepts in your subject is a preliminary step toward ontological analysis, which we will cover in depth in the next video. Here are some good software tools for mind mapping. Take a look at XMind, MindNode, The Brain, pricey but very powerful, FreeMind, and look up on Wikipedia.org the list of concept and mind mapping software, complete with links to the software developers. Finally, let's talk about testing your understanding. After employing the workable methods for building understanding that we have presented earlier, then it's time to test your understanding. You should be able to think through the subject as a chain of cause and effect from beginning to end. Try modeling different scenarios in your mind and see if the conclusions you get agree with the source materials and your experience. Since your aim in all this is to teach yourself a specific skill, 
The ultimate test of understanding is that you are able to perform the skill at a professional level of competence. This will take practice. And here's one of my favorite sayings. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're different. By Yogi Berra. Modeling, as powerful as it is, has to assume that the subject exists in isolation, as in a laboratory setting. That is the only way to reduce the number of variables to a manageable level. Be aware of your model's limits. Your model can never be completely perfect because in the real world your subject does not exist in isolation. It will be impacted by various situations and environments with results impossible to predict with complete certainty. But you can come very close. Thank you.